Good evening, everybody. This is Cora in your corner. It is May 27th, 2020, and we're talking about adult baseball injuries. I want to introduce our panel. Um, starting with Ryan, go ahead. How you doing? I'm Ryan Knuckles. I'm from St. Louis area. I'm a clinic manager at the Baldwin facility. I uh, grew up playing baseball, played base, third base, so uh, about 10 years experience playing ball and three different head athletes as a passion for the past seven years. Tyler? Hey everybody, I'm Tyler Kelly, the senior clinic manager in Virginia. Uh, I'm a licensed physical therapist assistant and also an athletic trainer. Uh, my experience with baseball goes up through uh, playing time in high school. I was mostly a catcher and I've also worked with uh, college baseball teams. Baseball teams. Wow, you're pretty brave. Catching is uh, uh, James, introduce yourself, buddy. Uh, I'm James Silvestri. I'm a senior clinic manager in East Tennessee. Um, I've had some uh, experience um, uh, in high school, but I got injured in high school. One reason why I got into physical therapy, but owned a practice in Louisiana for 10 years, which was attached to a baseball academy. So we treated baseball players for the majority of the time, anywhere from young kids to mainly uh, high school and college athletes. So a um, little bit of experience there uh, treating those guys. You know, a lot of Thank you, Shane. Introduce yourself. Hi, guys. Uh, my name is Shane Lawler. I'm the regional manager for Cora, Missouri. Um, I think I'm, uh, along with these esteemed guests here, I've been treating patients a long time, a lot of throwing athletes, um, and so look forward to having this discussion uh, around adult baseball. Let's just jump right in here. And, you know, I think in the, in the face of this COVID sheltering in place issue, we've got a lot of athletes that are coming back that are getting ready to play sports, but they really haven't done anything over the last two, three months. So, I guess I'm going to start with you, Shane. What, what can an athlete do to prepare knowing that they've been pretty stagnant, uh, pretty inactive, and uh, baseball season starts and they're thrown out there? Um, what, what tips do you have in terms of preparation? You know, I, I think there's a wide gamut of things. And the reality is because everything is delayed and there's no team practices, at least in the state of Missouri, those are all delayed. And so coaches have been giving their athletes, uh, you know, preparation programs to return, whether that is core strengthening, that's fitness and conditioning, um, that's even short toss, long toss, all those things that go into baseball, they have to be doing. So I really think the, the athlete's health and the risk of injury is in their own hands. And so the more they're prepping, ahead of time to get ready for the in-season play, uh, the better off they're going to be. But all those programs are individualized, whether it's core strengthening, it's in the gym or, or at, at home weight training, um, and getting creative. They have to be creative to, um, to simulate some of those, the acceleration and the deceleration of, of stealing bases. So um, hopefully coaches have done a good job of prepping those players before they go back. All right, so along those lines, and that's really a good point, what can the coaches do? Around the field, uh, the kids have worked out the best they can. Maybe it's not ideal. Give me, give me an idea what A, physical therapists can do, and B, what, what can the coaches do to kind of facilitate this? Um, I really think uh, whether it's, you know, if, if I've got a team – and I'm trying to prepare them to get back in the batting cages, and I'm expecting them to take quite a few swings. Um, then I'm going to be working on some core strengthening that will replicate the same kind of reps. It will replicate the same sort of intensity. Um, if I'm expecting I've got some outfielders or I've got some kids who steal bases, I need them to work on the sprints. And what are my distances? My distances might be from base to base, and I've got them on a stopwatch. I've got them timed. So there's a lot of activities that they can specifically do uh, for those players to return and get them ready and at least reduce the risk. But ultimately, there's no replacement for getting them back into game simulation practice with that team. I mean, ultimately, that's the best practice 
Um, and right now, I think they're just kind of holding their breath to get back there. Over the last probably month, I've been on ESPN four or five times, and we've been discussing return to baseball, mostly professional return to baseball. But one of the issues has been overuse injuries. And I guess my question is, how do you see this unfolding as we go from being kind of stagnant and inactive to returning to the baseball diamond? And how do you see overuse injuries and what overuse injuries do you think we can expect? Well, honestly, I think um, Shane's on the right path with some of this. I think that, um, you know, it was a, a lot of this was in the players' hands of being able to develop themselves. And I think even with the extended time off that they have had actually more time to prepare for the season. So I think that, that a lot of it was in their hands and be able to come back and be actually better off than they were prior. So um, what kind of overuse injuries? Probably some of the same ones, but it's going to be the players who obviously didn't prepare themselves enough for a season. So you know, some of those things that we're always going to see, either with shoulder, elbow injuries, hamstring strains, those initial things that people will see initially in the, in the training um, uh, season, I think we're still going to see those, maybe not necessarily to the higher degree, um, but they'll still be prevalent. That's excellent. So as we get back to baseball, there's a couple of injuries that, as an orthopedic surgeon, I see all the time. And one of them is hamstring injuries. And I can't tell you how many baseball players I've seen with hamstring injuries, recurrent hamstring injuries. So Tyler, give me an idea of why you think we see so many hamstring injuries and maybe more important, give me a return to play uh, paradigm and some timing. How long do you think it takes to return to play after a hamstring injury? And obviously there's severity of different hamstring injuries but give me your thoughts on why we see him, number one, and how long do you think it's going to take the average adult athlete to come back playing baseball? And that could be a college baseball player, professional baseball player, returning after a uh, hammy. I mean, one of the main reasons that we see hamstring injuries is it's one of the most common injuries in baseball it has to do with deceleration while running the bases. I think the most common time you see it while watching a game is a player running out uh, – a base hit through first base and they try and decelerate as they get close to the back because the hamstring tears occur most commonly during the eccentric loading phase of the hamstring. So when they're trying to slow down, uh, as far as how long an individual is going to be out with a hamstring injury, like you said, is entirely going to depend on the severity and grade of the hamstring strain. I mean, it could be as simple as just a few weeks. And sometimes these hamstring injuries can really lag around for six, nine, even 12 weeks, depending on how severe it is, uh, and then any aggravation factors during rehab. I mean, the first phase of it is just going to be allowed to heal and then working soft tissue mobilization. Uh, and then once you get back to the re-strengthening phase, you want to focus your strengthening phase on reteaching the muscle how to be stronger during that eccentric loading. Um, I was reading some uh, research earlier that from 1998 to 2015, over the 18-year period, 9.5% of all baseball injuries in Major League Baseball were thigh injuries, and they actually accounted for about 6% of time spent on the DL. So it can give you an idea of how long a hamstring can really put you out for. So give me, you know, that's a that, – that, that, it's a great answer, uh, and I think you're right. They are deceleration injuries, and I think one of the big problems we see in our practice are recurrent hamstring injuries. So we treat these athletes, they're doing okay, and then they re-injure. So give me an idea of strengthening, a strengthening protocol or, or what the normal off-season program and during-season program, maybe more importantly off-season program, would look like in terms of strengthening the hamstrings? What kind of exercises should these kids be doing, number one, how frequently, and what are the best exercises to strengthen the hammy? I mean, the hamstring, I mean, its main function is for flexion of the knee. A lot of the baseball players that I have come in and most of my high school athletes that I see, I'm working with them using resistance bands trying to pull back against the band quickly and then slow down my resistance when I'm pulling back to myself to try and work the deceleration phase. Oftentimes I'll have them working hamstring activities against gravity 
so that they're having to work against that flexion coming into knee extension, but slowly controlling that. Uh, these, these athletes need to be working on, on these exercises as well as most of their programs, like Shane talked about, core strengthening uh, two, three times a week. You don't want to work the hamstrings a ton and overload them with eccentric injuries because then you're kind of putting yourself in a pickle where you might be asking for an injury. That's excellent. So we're going to move down south just a little bit. And Ryan, um, I guess as common in my practice uh, in, in terms of injuries or maybe percentage injuries in baseball players are, and these are non-pitchers, generally position players, are Achilles injuries. So tell me, how do we protect the Achilles? How do we avoid Achilles injuries, number one? How do we protect the Achilles? And what do we do when we see somebody who comes in with an Achilles strain, a partial tear, tendonitis? How are we going to treat that? I like to focus on down, getting in there, doing some soft tissue, getting the healing process going. Uh, the huge thing is education, though. Educating that patient on not only stretching, because everybody does static stretching, but also dynamic stretching. You don't dynamically stretch the muscle, and get that heated up and warmed up and the tendon going. Uh, you're just going to cause further degradation if there's already some sort of tendon injury or partial tear. Um, you know, on your and things like that come in to try to prevent from doing a, a Achilles reconstruction. But uh, uh, it's just really trying to work that soft tissue there and making sure the patient has proper gastroxoleus length, have proper ankle mobility. Because if all of those compounding factors come together and the patient doesn't have proper balance, it leads to uh, weakness in the tendon and ultimately that, that Achilles is Thank you. Um, sliding. So this is an age old battle. Um, the Lou Brocks of the world say you should never slide head first. 2020, we have difficulty getting anybody to slide feet first. So give us an idea of which way you should slide, which way is the safest way to slide, and what are the pros and cons in terms of head first versus sliding feet first? Sure, yeah. So obviously, if you think of the head first sliding, uh, I'm a head coach. I don't want my pitcher sliding head first. Uh, it's money makers in his arm, right? So protect that. But uh, there's a pretty interesting study done by Hosey over 7,600 balls and found that the majority are on the DL for the prolonged time, lower extremity and slot first. Um, there's such a and usually a little more force going into the base. Um, first, they had a greater cost of ankle sprains and 13% ankle fractures. So, um, more, I guess, invasive injuries that take a little longer to heal. Um, it's pretty interesting. There was a Little League study that had breakaway bases. So, the, the breakaway bases that came uh, decreased that injury rate by 95% which is pretty profound. So overall, they say head first sliding is safer, but if I have a pitcher, I would tell that guy to never slide head first. Why is your pitcher sliding anyway? All right, James, yeah. you're not off the hook here. Um, so I guess the next big issue in baseball and something we see all the time, and I think it, we actually see it as the athletes become more sophisticated, so more common, in college baseball players, a lot more common in professional baseball players, and that's the dreaded oblique. So give us your thoughts on A, why people get oblique injuries, and B, how do you treat them? And again, uh, return to play time. What, what, what severity, how long does it take to come back with a severe oblique strain versus a minor oblique strain, and how do you treat those? Yeah, I mean, I think you're right. I mean, because of the... Um, the, the speed of the game and the, the, the strength of the players, the com combination of the two contribute to these um, oblique strains. Um, so there's a lot of force being generated with rotation, obviously with both hitting and throwing. Um, but uh, that is generally why, and particularly like hitters who end up having to go maybe uh, 
uh, try to attack a pitch that they think is coming across the plate, but then ends up dop, dipping outside. So they have to make an adjustment that they're not uh, they're not prepared for, can lead to those types of injuries. Um, so you know you can have minor oblique strain. Usually, internal oblique is the issue, um, uh, or to a major oblique strain. Generally, I mean they can last from either a few weeks to several months based on the severity. Um, so you know. As a particular guide, I mean, uh, you're talking about um, initially you're just trying to get the flare uh, pain for it. Um, and that's hard to do, particularly in an oblique strain, because it's not like a calf injury or a hamstring injury where you can isolate that particular body part and they can exercise everything else. They don't realize how much they use their core, even just tie their shoe, you know, go to the bathroom, God forbid they have to sneeze because that is a major issue for them. I mean, so, um, you know, just getting pain free. Sometimes that requires doing stuff just like taping an area, maybe with leukotape, just try to stabilize. But initially, the, the initial treatment for that, for me, is, is just getting them to breathe correctly. So even initiating some diaphragmatic work, where we're trying to engage their transverse abdominis, their pelvic floor, just to create that cylinder of, of pressure, intra-abdominal pressure to stabilize, is what we usually start with. And then progressing from there and also in different positions. So you're trying to get them just to figure out things they can do pain free. Starting in supine, working into sideline, working to half kneeling, working into standing, eventually progressing to more, um, even some isometric core work, but it all basically boils down to core stabilization. Um, eventually working even to more advanced stuff, even chops, lifts, uh, medicine ball routines, um, eventually, you know, continuing doing some cardiovascular work, cardiovascular work throughout all of this to just to maintain the cardiovascular fitness. Um, but then working more in sport specific activity or position specific activity. A lot of it is like obviously it's hitting and throwing. So, you know, trying to get them to gradually increase their hitting intensity and throwing intensity sometimes can be a challenge, at least in my experience. The hitters tend to have a hard time pulling off on the ball versus our throwers, which you can gradually increase distance to grade their intensity. So sometimes it's a little bit more of a difficult time getting them to pull off. I mean, they're, you know, college athletes, especially, they're all going, ho, they want to get better. But sometimes there's a psychological component that goes with that, that they're, they're a little hesitant at times. Most often they're not, they really want to go after it. So that's where we start. And as far as like prevention, as far as trying to get them to work out of that, you know, I think a lot of it has to do with the assessment, either preseason, midseason, postseason. Um, I think the FMS, functional movement screens, the uh, SFMA, I think are fairly important because they kind of tease out dysfunctions that may also contribute to those issues. Or uh, particularly in my case, I feel like hip rotational issues, dysfunctions, and or thoracic spine. I think thoracic spine is probably the biggest on top of that, the thoracic spine issues, we're talking about regional interdependence here, that can lead to these other issues popping up. So, you know, once you've cleaned up those issues, then you can work towards more like a comprehensive spinal stabilization and strengthening program, working on your anti-gravity rotation, side banding and extension exercises. That's excellent. Um, so, I think there is, I think you're right. I think there's a little bit of a psychological component to this. And I think that the athletes generally are worried about getting re-injured. And I think it's incumbent upon the therapist and the doctor doesn't really see them as frequently as you guys are seeing them. So it's incumbent upon the, the therapist to really promote, hey, you're okay, your strength is good. Let's do some progressions. Let's work on some rotation. And I think that is a very good point. So Tyler, along the same lines, since we're now talking about oblique injuries, let's, let's kind of slide a little bit. And let's talk about back injuries, lumbar spine, thoracic spine injuries. And, and what do you see and how do you treat, I'm gonna say mostly uh, TL and, and, and lumbar spine injuries in adult baseball players? Well, the first thing you wanna do is you wanna calm down the spasming that's gonna come uh, associated with the, the pain levels. Uh, and then I think I've heard the phrase here quite a bit already, uh, core stabilization. Um, we can focus on throwing harder, throwing faster, uh, and being able to keep our eye on the ball as much as we want. But 
it seems with everything we've we've talked about that core stabilization is kind of the center of everything. I mean, it's, it's why we call it the core. It's the middle of everything. And we're going to focus on retraining the muscles, uh, in both in what I call the, the lower and the upper core, so that we don't get these overuse injuries in the lumbar spine. Um, but first, we're going to calm down um, symptoms associated with the initial injury. And then we're going to do a re-strengthening program uh, that's probably going to be pretty similar to the other programs we're doing for any of the other injuries. That's excellent. So listen, you guys have been awesome. Uh, I think there's a lot of good information and I just like to open the floor. I'm going to give everybody a chance to throw out one tip. We lost Shane. So, um, let's, uh, let's start with Ryan. And, um, if you got one pearl or one tip for rehab in terms of baseball players, injuries, in terms of baseball baseball players. Players. uh, let's hear it. Yeah, I can tell all of my little league kids that come into uh, the clinic, when you go to a baseball game, what do you see the players do? Before they... All the players are they're stretching, uh, warming up, doing their dynamic stretches, doing their open gate, closed gate stretches. Um, it's just so important that stretching and the dynamic warm up is to get tissues and get their shoulder loose and a short toss. Um, but trying to really educate my that that portion of the game is much overlooked, and that's ultimately what will keep them healthy. Awesome. All right, I'm throwing it out to you, Tyler. Give me, uh, give me your pearl. And, you know, I think you made a really good point, and, and, and that is everything really starts with hip rotation and core rotation. And, and I really think that if your core is strong, because baseball is a rotational sport and a deceleration sport, and basically, I think those components are, are, are very important. So give me your pearl in terms of uh, treating baseball players. Um, give, us, give us any pearl you want to throw out there that uh, fits along the experience you've had. I mean, it's kind of like I alluded to with the lumbar question and uh, Jim also referred to with some of his uh, retraining programs. And you just said there, it's about, to me, it's a lot about the core. I think of the core as like the foundation and base of a house. You, you don't build a house without putting a foundation underneath it first. And when we're doing all the movements through different sports and baseball, especially with rotational movements coming from the shoulder and hips, if the center of your body, if your core is not strong, you're going to have compensatory mechanisms coming somewhere down along the line where something's going to be moving where it shouldn't be. So you have to solidify your core to make sure it's as strong as possible. So you don't have something else trying to overwork, which increases your chance of an overuse injury. That is very well put. All right, Jim, balls in your court, buddy. Give us your uh, years and years of, of experience and uh, give us a tip for everybody listening to uh, the podcast. Okay, so I feel like, you know, all these injuries, obviously they don't occur in a vacuum. There's a, typically, there's multiple issues that go into the, why somebody gets injured. So we have to address them all. So, you know, as a clinician, always taking a proper history and getting that information first is, I think, is paramount. And then doing the assessment and getting a proper assessment with these guys is so important to kind of figure out what may be going on to kind of prevent these things from even happening. So, you know, once they have an injury, I'm telling you something, usually you can't speed up your, your recovery, but you can certainly delay it, right? I mean, you, and a lot of these guys, it's all about pulling them back sometimes so they don't re-injure themselves. Let pain be their guide. Um, but don't let it rule their rehab. I mean, so, you know, continue with that process. Continue to reassess and kind of look at other areas other than the primary injury. And I think you'll have better success at not, you know, re-injuring themselves. Everybody, listen, thank you. This was uh, outstanding, uh, a very good basis. I think a lot of information. Baseball injuries are tough. And again, I think we're going to see a lot of baseball injuries going from immobilization, sheltering in place, social distancing, all of a sudden, hey, you know, we got nine guys on a baseball field and uh, everybody's going to go out at 100%. And I think we're going to see a different pattern than we've ever seen before. So. Everybody, thank you very much for your time. Uh, Corner in Your Corner has been phenomenal.
And uh, we thank you. You guys have a good night. <laughs>